financialization is about mature countries, the core of uh, global capitalism, but increasingly, the last 10, 15 years, developing countries have been sucked into it. The most interesting aspect of financialization in the 2000s has been the um, absorption of significant numbers of developing countries, middle-income countries, into this realm. Um, but that kind of financialization is derivative or subordinate financialization. It derives from, finan from finan financialization in the advanced countries, in the mature countries, and uh, I will show you how that happens. This is interesting for Europe because in Europe we have both types of financialization. We have mature financialization at the core and we have subordinate financialization in the periphery. Let's go back to the productive enterprises, to the banks and to the households and see how their behavior and contact has changed the last three to four decades and then understand financialization. What can we say about the, uh, the non-financials, the commercial and industrial enterprises of the modern era, particularly the large multinationals, the big capital groups that basically control the global economy. Well, what we can say is that contrary to what is often thought, and certainly contrary to what happened uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, big business and big banks are not more closely together. Actually, they are more separate today. Big banks, uh, big business doesn't rely so heavily on big banks as it did before. That's one characteristic feature of financialization. We see a gap opening between um, big industry and big commerce uh, and big banks. And that uh, is fundamentally because big business can finance its um, investment heavily through retained earnings. As I will show you in a minute, the bulk of investment on a net basis is financed through retained profits. That doesn't mean that big business doesn't use banks. Of course it uses banks. This has to be understood in relative <coughs> terms. However, the bulk of investment on a net basis comes, comes entirely from retained profits, uh, not from banks uh, as external funding. That's a key aspect of the transformation of relations between uh, the big industrial and commercial enterprises and the big banks. The interesting thing is that as this has happened and big business has come to rely more on retained profits, big business has financialized itself. Big business has acquired capacity and skills in engaging in financial uh, transactions on own account. And, 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 and large industrial and commercial enterprises have acquired financial capabilities and have begun to make profit out of financial transactions. Financialization, in other words, has its roots in the non-financial world, in the productive world in the first place. It, it, it comes from the transformation of um, non-financial enterprises. And what, I, what I did was to uh, calculate estimate the funding of investment on a net basis out of retained profits, banks, and market finance. In other words, issuing of bonds by uh, large, uh, by, by, the, by, by, by the real sector, in that sense, by the non-financial sector. And you can see very clearly that 100% of investment is financed out of uh, retained earnings, the top line. Uh, not only this, but in the period uh, of, the 2000, of the 2000s, the last period, you can see that retained earnings ro rise enormously. And they actually rise 50% above investment needs. In other words, big business in the United States and elsewhere is sitting on huge amounts of money. If the large industrial and commercial co corporations are doing this, then the world changes for the banks because obviously the banks are, in the, are, are capitalist uh, businesses that want to make profit. And they began to extract profits, not so much out of lending and collecting spare funds and lending them to, 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 to industry and trade for projects, but out of transacting in open markets and making fees and commissions. This part of bank of, uh, profitability has increased very considerably uh, in the years of financialization, indicating transformation of banking. Same time, Banks have shifted their activities towards households. If you cannot make profits so much by lending, by lending to productive and uh, industrial and commercial enterprises, you begin to see profits 
other blending to households, and the household has become uh, a pivotal area of activity uh, for banks. So here is some data, some evidence that are calculated for the United States. You will see, uh, you see clearly the, uh, the purple line, which is lending by banks to um, uh, commercial and industrial uh, businesses, and you can see the collapses. Uh, the, the rapid decline that, that, that begins to occur from the 1980s onwards. U.S. banks lend far less to commercial and industrial businesses, and you can see what jumps and increases household mortgages uh, increase rapidly, and of course commercial mortgages also increase. So the story is fairly clear for the United States, which in a sense is the motherland of financialization. Um, not that different although in some variation uh, for the United Kingdom. What is characteristic, what's interesting about the United Kingdom is that lending to commercial and industrial businesses has actually held together better in the 2000s. But the basic story uh, you can see for the UK too, as far as banks are concerned. Banks have become transactors, essentially, in the United States and other markets, and they are lending heavily to households uh, for all the purposes, which I will show you now. And we come to households. The household dimension of financialization, in some ways, is the most striking. Um, the implication of households into the formal financial system, the absorption of the household into the formal financial system, is the most impressive uh, transformation of capitalism in the last three to four decades. You can see that on the side of the liabilities. Household indebtedness has gone through the roof, as I will show you uh, in a minute. Um, there are variations, but that is observed. The bulk of that is for mortgages. I say this because a lot of people have put in their minds uh, a kind of model, which I will come in a minute, that people borrow because they haven't got enough income to allow them to consume. There is a certain kind of thinking that says, Household borrowing has increased, and the reason is uh, household income is not rising fast enough, therefore people borrowing to keep consumption up. There is an element of truth in this, but the bulk of borrowing is actually for housing, mortgages. Now, I understand that some of this uh, mortgage debt might actually be for consumption. People borrow against the value of their own homes and use it for all sorts of purposes. It's very hard to that. However, there is no doubt that formally and also conceptually and in practice, the bulk of borrowing by people still is to buy a house uh, rather than uh, rather to do so. The financialization of pensions is one of the most striking things of the last three to four decades. Banks and other financial institutions can make a profit out of the assets too, not just out of debt, because they handle the assets. So household financialization is a field of profitability for financial institutions of both sides of the balance sheet. It isn't just debt. Also, financialized assets are a source of profit making uh, for financial institutions. Now, what explains this um, involvement of the household? As I said before, a lot of people argue that it has to do with, with, uh, with uh, stagnant or very slowly rising real incomes. It's true. It's a stylized style. The real incomes, particularly in the United States, have been stagnant for nearly four decades now. And real incomes are not rising very fast at all for significant periods of time in most of the developed world. It's true. Um, but that is not really uh, a significant, uh, a sufficient explanation from my perspective. It, it is in this very simple economic stats. Um, People borrow for a variety of reasons, and banks lend for a variety of reasons. The notion that household income would not be rising, but banks would be lending more and more to, to households just doesn't add up. Well, actually, the story is actually a lot more complex than that, and it has to do with public provision in my view. Households borrow typically for housing, for education, for health, and then to a certain degree for consumption. In other words, households borrow for fundamental needs. Now, in many countries, developed countries, uh, a great proportion of those needs historically has been met through public provision. Public provision in housing, public provision in education, health, and so on. 
What we witnessed in the years of financialization is a retreat of public provision for reasons of neoliberalism. Public provision has been replaced by private provision uh, because someone has to provide. So uh, we, have a, we have the replacement of, uh, of public of, of private for public uh, provision during this um, period. Private provision typically is mediated by private finance. Financialization of the household then has to do with that. Finance has emerged as the mediator of private provision uh, in health, education, housing, and so on. And finance has, has uh, arrogated to itself this role for which it has no skill at all. Uh, there is no reason to think that finance has any kind of social skill in mediating this kind of activity. And yet it has happened. And that, to me, is what explains uh, most traction the financialization of the household during the last three to four decades. It isn't just money uh, anymore, okay? I want to say that that's the first thing to, to, to bear in mind when you look at this picture. The second thing to bear in mind is that if this is what banks have been doing, and this is where they make the, 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 they've been making a large part of their money from, this is a new form of profit. This, is, this indicates that large parts of financial profit, bank profit, and now come out of household income rather than out of the projects that uh, businesses uh, engage in. This is a very different source uh, of profit making. And that indicates to me a key transformation of capitalism during the last three to four decades. And it indicates to me, well, I'll discuss it in detail here, uh, where the predatory aspect of financialization comes from. Finance, you see, is a predatory uh, economic activity anyway, because finance is detached from production. It doesn't care where its profits come from. If they come from the household, finance is a predatory field open to it. Because the household is structurally weaker compared to finance. Financial lending to big business is essentially one capitalist lending to another. They are on a par. OK, it's more a lender, but they are capitalists. And when it comes to big business, big business is no less powerful than big banks. So they can relate to each other pretty much on a, on a basis of um, Fundamental equality. Big, big banks lending to households is a very different story. The household borrows for everyday needs. The household has, has got far less access to information, far less power compared to banks. If the household becomes a field of profit making, that is like an invitation to financial institutions to engage in predatory activities and to begin to extract profit in essentially expropriating ways. Financial expropriation for me then is a key aspect financialization, and there we see um, some uh, of the material. Uh, so, to sum up, financialization in mature capitalist countries represents a structural transformation, which I just described to you, at the molecular level. And second, the emergence of new fields of profit making, financial profit, to a large extent out of households, but also out of financial transactions, out of any sum of money, any, any flow of money. Finance isn't particular. It can make profits anywhere. It doesn't care whether they come out of productive activity, non-productive activity, people's income, it doesn't matter. It still is financial profit. That then, I think, is financialization. One last thing. In developing countries, the, the, this process, which <clears throat> I think began in developed countries in the 70s, picked up speed in the 80s, began to increase rapidly in the 90s and exploded in the 2000s. This process also began to emerge in the 2000s in developing countries, middle-income countries, which have a significant middle class, essentially, uh, because very poor developing countries provide very little um, space and room for this kind of process. But in places like Brazil, Turkey, India, uh, Thailand, and so on, in Mexico, it's possible to get uh, some of these uh, processes uh, emerging, and indeed, that's what we've begun to see. But the key point here is this kind of financialization, which is actually very rapid now, hasn't come from within as much as from without. It's derived from the impact of the foreign flows of money into those countries. I want to say a few things about financialization in the context of Europe, and I want to give you an angle on the Eurozone crisis, which perhaps you haven't heard before. There has been financialization in Europe, and I would argue that this financialization has operated on two levels. 
pivoting on the common currency. You can see the euro and the European Monetary Union um, as a lever for differential financialization uh, at the core and the periphery uh, of the eurozone. Uh, in other words, you can see the split between core and periphery of the eurozone and the split between mature and uh, subordinate uh, financialization in Europe. What's the European Monetary Union? The European Monetary Union is basically a formal alliance to create an international reserve currency. That's first and foremost is that, to create a competitor against the dollar. Um, but it's also a formal alliance to create a domestic monetary standard of the 18 member countries. These two things, the international euro and the domestic euro, didn't have to coincide. Europe chose to make it that way. You didn't have to have a currency that would have been a domestic standard as well as the internationally used means of payment. Europe would have kept domestic monies and invented an international money if you wished to do that. It would have been perfectly possible. It would have required different monetary arrangements, but it would have been perfectly possible. But Euro chose to invent this money, which attempts to be both domestic and international at once for all uh, 18 countries that are um, bound by treaty uh, to it. Now, the point is, the international and domestic role of the Euro clash with each other in the context of global financialization. Um, the global euro wants to be one thing, the domestic euro wants to be another, from country to country. Um, and the changes needed to make the two roles of the euro compatible with each other, institutionally highly unlikely um, in Europe at the moment. I'm being very schematic, because I haven't got time. I'm happy to discuss that later. I just want to give you the gist of it. Um, the point is, the clash between the domestic and the international role of the euro, which has been intrinsic to it, is reflected in subordinate financialization in the periphery. This is what has caused financialization uh, in the periphery in the last 15 years. Greece collapsed more than others, but the, the process is similar in Spain and also. The result, mature, mature financialization of the core, subordinate financialization of the periphery. This is hidden for a period, because the banking system grows in Europe. Because, because European economies financialize. Because there's provision of credit. Provision of credit means that the, this divergence and this imbalance can be masked. How? Vast accumulation of debt. You're masking it, but you're accumulating debt. Europe then accumulated enormous amounts of debt, which I will show you in a minute. Vast accumulation of debt, which is, of course, the first signal of financialization. It's mostly private debt held by banks and by enterprises. Public debt explodes after 2009. Public debt is much less than private debt, as I will show you, but it explodes after 2009. It's not really the cause of what's happening, it's a result of what's happening. The key thing here is that the debt of the core, of the core which has financialized in this, in this way, is actually denominated in euro and it's domestic debt because it's controlled by a currency that's controlled by the core. The debt of the periphery is still denominated in euros and it appears as domestic but in reality it's external, it's foreign because the periphery doesn't control the euros. So the periphery finds itself enormously indebted and financialized without the means of dealing with this debt. Here is European debt through this process and sign uh, a snapshot of financialization. Have you got, you haven't got a laser there. Let me just try this. <coughs> right. You see it? Yes. Right. This is basically the debt of financial uh, institutions, banks and so on. And you can see how this debt You can see how this debt begins to increase uh, rapidly from about 2005 onwards. And then it sort of flattens out after about 2009, 10 when the crisis emerges. Uh, and then actually it begins to decline. It begins to decline after 2012 when the European banking system begins to shrink, basically. Um, so that is the first element of um, 
that and the first indication of initialization uh, that I want to point out. Second type of debt is the debt of um, non-financial enterprises, which is this. It, it catalyzed growth of finance at the core and growth of finance in the periphery through the common currency, and it led to this accumulation of debt, which has got a very different uh, structural position in the core compared to the periphery because of how uh, the common currency works. What has been the EU counter crisis policy? Completely consistent with continuing financialization. Why? Well, the main concern of the EU has been to fix the international malfunction of the euro. In other words, to fix, to, to defend the euro as global currency, irrespective of what would have happened to uh, the domestic perform performance of the euro, in, in particularly in the periphery. No, no care was uh, lavished on that uh, very much at all. And that meant austerity, privatization, and uh, uh, liberalization of markets. Essentially that, the whole internet. Uh, at the same time, the European Union um, replaced private capital flows that had expanded in the years of financialization from core to periphery with official uh, flows. Again, from core to periphery, but this time through official channels rather than through private channels. The result? The result, you know. A crisis of financialization of a particular type in Europe. Pivoting on the common currency. Europe is in a particularly deep financialization crisis because of the common currency. And you can see the difference with the United States, which is also in a crisis of financialization, went through it, but in a different way. But Europe finance, has financialized through the common currency, therefore it's facing a particularly protracted and difficult crisis because of that. And obviously, the story is well known, collapsing demand, huge social costs. The debt position has actually worsened, as I've shown you. Debt hasn't actually become any better because art has contracted in the same period. Um, so does the domestic private credit at the same time, because banks are holding credit. Banks don't lend in Europe, uh, because they're trying to deal with uh, problematic balances. Um, and of course, lack of growth prospects and rising social tensions. This is a crisis of, crisis of financialization in Europe that looks the closest um, to the 1930s. Um, it's a crisis of stagnation, essentially, um, with all attendant uh, social phenomena. And again, I repeat, it's because of the nature of the um, currency, uh, which has shaped the crisis. Well, let me finish now. I'll take five minutes, right? so I'm well within time. Let me finish now after taking you, you through this long uh, journey uh, with what to do about financialization. There are some people in the United States uh, and elsewhere who have done a lot of work on financialization who see financialization as the result of regulatory change. They recognize many of these transformations, and they think that they have taken place because of financial deregulation. It's not true that there hasn't been regulation during that period. There's been plenty of regulation, but it has been regulation of a particular type. In other words, regulation determined and driven by banks. Okay. Uh, regulation without teeth. So that's what really we mean by financial deregulation. So there are people who uh, think financialization is the result of deregulation. That is what's behind this uh, problematic process. And therefore, the answer is clear. We need to re-regulate. Finance needs to be re-regulated. And re-regulation, in a sense, will put the genie back into the bottle. Okay. Now, I don't agree with that. Um, obviously, we need re-regulation. Obviously, we need tough regulation of finance, clearly. The period of tough regulation of finance in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, those 25 years, were years of much more rapid growth and much more stable uh, growth performance. Uh, no question at all about it. Um, but re-regulating finance isn't enough, in my view. And the reason is, as I've explained already, financialization, the ascendancy of finance has got deep foundations. This isn't simply a matter of regulation. It has to do with the altered conduct and performance of banks, uh, non-financials, and households. And therefore, 
Changing financialization is not simply a matter of policy, nor a matter of simply of regulation. In my view, financialization needs to be reversed as a, as a, as a, as a epochal development. I say this with some trepidation because people who look at the development of capitalism usually try and take what is progressive out of this and try and transform it into something that's good for society as a whole technological change, certain forms of uh, company organization, um, certain rational ways of organizing trade, for instance. But let's keep these and let's give them a social dimension, which is generally a good thing to do. With financialization, there is very little that can be found that's positive in this way. This is one of these historical periods which has got very little that's positive about it. What exactly is the net benefit to humanity from being able to trade financial assets in real time across the world at any moment in time? What exactly is, what exactly is the benefit of humanity? What, why do we gain if, if we can trade derivatives in split seconds? Take five minutes. You, you have a cup of coffee. You, you know. I mean, what exactly, what does it add? The, the, the welfare benefit is, is, is not clear at all. In fact, I would argue it don't exist. So financialization is one of those periods that actually has to be reversed. It has to be put in reverse. But putting it in reverse is not easy because if it comes from the financialization of non-financial enterprises, that means that the, 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 the conduct of non-financial enterprises must be changed. That means that there must be a new outlook with regard to investment, a new outlook with regard to using spare funds. This isn't simply a matter of regulation. Clearly, this is a matter of public policy more generally and of running big, big, big business. Um, Vito for banks. If it is a matter of transformed behavior of banks, then it isn't simply a case of, of regulating banks. It's a case of transforming banks themselves again. Not stopping them from doing certain things, but actually making them do other things. Making them finance uh, productive activities and play fewer games. Finally, if financialization is to do with the transformed conduct of the household because of the reasons that I pointed out to you previously, then clearly, if, if we are to undo that, we need to do something about public provision of health, public provision of housing, public provision of education, and so on. We need to restore that. You understand then that if this is a period change, and someone has to do something about it, we're talking about wholesale transformation here. Uh, we're talking about the change that goes from top to bottom uh, of society, uh, a change that is uh, quite profound. In other words, confronting financialization, if you approach it this way, I would argue, would bring innovative, communal, and associational policies into play across the field uh, of activities of uh, business, banks, and households. Uh, by the same token, it would reject the state in wage restraint. And basically and fundamentally, it would be an inherently anti capitalist uh, direction of policy, an anti capitalist direction of change, that would open fresh avenues of social development. I would say that it is either this or a period of continued instability. Uh, low incomes, increasing social differentiation, and finance deciding policies uh, across the board. Um, so far, finance has, has actually succeeded in keeping things going, even after the crisis of 2007-2009. But it hasn't put itself on a uh, firmer footing. I believe that change is in the air, and I think it ought to move in this direction if we're going to avoid uh, major disasters and taking the view of it. That's it, thank you very much. You started your presentation with showing how uh, banks, and especially uh, business, have increased their profits, and you've ended by saying that they've increased their debt at the same time. I was wondering how they relate to each other and why do they don't uh, 
pick each other out. You mean pro bank profits and bank debts? Exactly, and the same for uh, business. So the second question, um, the, the enormous possibilities of the financial sector are to some degree related to tax evasion. They don't pay many taxes. So could you elaborate on that and also what can be done about it? For me, isn't it a contradiction that you propose state capitalism as an anti-capitalist solution? When did I propose state capitalism? You say, you say we need public banks and you say we need public this and public that, but that's, in, that's state capitalism. That's already tried before in, in, in countries and stuff like that. And then you say we need an anti-capitalist solution. What I, I agree, we need an anti-capitalist solution, but for me, state capitalism is not an anti-capitalist solution. Um, Banks are intermediaries, uh, and they make a profit out of using other people's money, which, for which they've got to pay something. Um, therefore, banks must become indebted. In other words, they must use other people's money in order to make money. Um, the question is, how does this happen? in relation to their assets, I mean, in relation, in relation to their capital. So the fact that bank profits rise while bank debts rise isn't a problem. Because if bank debts rise, bank assets are also rising. A bank can make more profits. What happened during that period of bank debt increase is that obviously bank leverage also increased, meaning the capital that they kept against the, this, the, this increased debt. Uh, was actually progressing. Listen, this was a mechanical way of improving the capitalization. So, because obviously, if you borrow more of the same capital, then the profits you make on the amount you borrow on other people's money relative to your capital becomes bigger. So you improve your profitability as a bank, and you appear to be a very clever banker, when in reality you've done nothing other than keep your own money stable, borrow other people's money, and make extra profits. Obviously, this is a very risky strategy, because at some point, uh, this bubble will burst, and then your own money will have to come to the place. Banks will never have enough of that, and therefore they call to the public to come and rescue them. Um, it's a very nice capitalist activity, this, uh, if you can get into it. Not everybody can get into it. So there is no problem, uh, per se. Um, um, increased indebtedness, or increased debt of uh, non financial enterprises. Uh, again, isn't a problem because assets are also increased. And what I showed you before was actually the funding of investment on a debt basis, which is 100% really debt uh, In other words, I am not arguing that bank, that, no, that, that commercial industrial enterprises don't use the financial markets or don't use banks. They do, and they do so heavily. But on a net basis, they don't rely on them to find the investment. That's it's a key, it's a, it's a fine point to, to grasp. Up. Um, so they're putting inventors, they're putting the inventors. Because when you, when, you, when you rely on banks to finance your investment, then the bank becomes a long-term participant in the activities of the business. If the bank finances fixed capital, as used to happen, for instance, in Japan in the 50s and the 60s, then the bank acquires structural power of the enterprise. Because the bank has, will have lent the enterprise for 10, 20, 30 years. That's not really what's happening at the moment. So uh, that is key to financialization. Uh, the point about tax, tax is very, very important. Um, tax has been uh, reduced for business throughout this period, be that financial or non-financial, as part of the neoliberal uh, approach to uh, uh, the economy. Because presumably, if you don't pay tax, um, you, will, you will be a very successful capitalist and so on. Now, it's a scandal, basically. The financial system um, is allowed all the tax banks and all the tax evasion mechanisms to be disallowed. I am not sure that this is the reason, either, uh, for the growth in the proportion of total profits uh, through financial I'm not sure that this is the reason. I think, I think financial profit has increased as a proportion of total profit because of 
financialization that we have discussed. Not, not simply because of tax breaks. The tax breaks have been um, quite widely held and quite widely uh, applied. Uh, as far as policy is concerned, on the other hand, no question, no question finances are taxed heavily, uh, no question financial transactions are taxed. Um, and um, sometimes it takes place, even in Europe, I mean, the Germans have been quite uh, aggressive to some extent. It is perfectly possible to do. The financial system always comes out and says you can't tax us, A, because you will destroy our efficiency, what efficiency you have to ask, and B, because we will get up and go. And where will you go? Yes, to ask. So, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, tax must increase uh, for a variety of reasons to restrain activity uh, and to provide more funding for uh, public spending. Uh, I don't think that the tax breaks are the reason for the uh, extraordinary increase in profits by financial institutions. It is most actual uh, underlying. By the way, I'm not advocating states. Um, we need to get one thing clear here. The solution to everything is not revolutionary socialism. I'm in favor of socialism. I'm not going to say but the solution to everything is not socialism. Right? Or rather, the answer to everything is not less good than that. Uh, one has to think carefully about the, the relation between the private and the public. We've got to start with that. Or the collective and the individual. In the end, socialism is about that. The balance between the collective and the individual. The private and the public. Okay. Uh, and the arguments we put across, from my perspective, must be always in favor of the collective against the individual and of the public against the, um, the, 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 the private. That doesn't mean to say that every last button in this world must be produced by uh, some state-owned enterprise. Right? That kind of argument is wrong, well, basically. Um, so that's how I approach it. Now, when we look at what I just said, all these arguments are consistent arguments about changing the balance between the private and the public in favor of the public. And I think that's what it is to we need to re-legitimize the public. We need to make, to make people understand and see that public ways of doing things are very frequently superior to private ways of doing things. This is obvious in the case of welfare. But even in the case of business, uh, this is how it is. Private banking is a monumental historical failure. If this was real capitalism, good proportion of the private banks of Europe and the United States would have been out of business, should have been out of business. They failed. On any kind of capitalist logic, they failed. And yet they're here. They have not been uh, eliminated. There is no evidence, in other words, that the private, in the context of finance, is superior to the public. Only, I would argue the opposite. The public, in the case of finance, is superior to the private. And that's what I'm arguing here. I'm arguing for, for a public approach to these things. Um, but obviously a public mechanism and a public approach that would be new itself. We don't want to reinvent public banks that would actually be driven and run by politicians and by established political parties and have corruption processes of that type. Um, the same with uh, housing, health and education. Public provision, I believe, works better things, but we want uh, a different approach and a different scale. That's what I'm arguing for. This is the state government. I'm arguing for a, a change in the balance of social forces, uh, <coughs> in favor of working people, in favor of labor, uh, for the public, and against capital and against the uh, uh, banks. If I may, I would like to elaborate on the question of my young colleague there, and the problem with public and private. Uh, uh, I think we can both follow your ideas concerning some of these issues. But the real struggle, I think, my colleague as well, when it comes to housing, um, perhaps the situation in the US is very different from here. But in Belgium, we have a very strong middle class because of housing and um, lending to households for housing. So that is a very strong element in our economy. And it uh, has uh, saved us 
for most of the crisis. So seeing as now that we would have to give it back to private, uh, to the public sector, is a bridge too far for us, I think. In what way has it saved? I don't quite understand. Because there is a very strong um, private ownership of housing. It has defended us from the crisis very strongly and it has established a very strong middle class in Belgium and the core countries of Europe. So that's very important to us and it has uh, it's shown it's worked. So your idea is very uh, strange. Uh, thank you for your uh, analysis. I wonder when you uh, talk about what to do, do you have concrete suggestions for individuals, groups, what to do? I mean, for, for me, for people here, for groups, yeah, what can we do concrete? Like I've already said, uh, it's impossible in the uh, aggregate flow of funds data to separate the large enterprises from the small and medium enterprises. And that is a problem because one would have liked to do that. Because the story must really best be, is really best told in terms of big business. But it's impossible. So what we see uh, incorporates small and medium businesses and that changes the story inevitably. And it changes it from country to country too because small and medium businesses are not the same uh, in their outlook among different countries. So uh, um, I, I cannot answer. Uh, what I can say, however, is that the relationship of banks to small and medium businesses is actually from other evidence and from uh, surveys and so on, is actually quite different from that of big businesses. And small and medium businesses do rely on banks uh, still quite considerably. And what you see there is a, is a well-established credit shortage, a credit gap, basically, um, which is very, very pronounced in developing countries where small and medium businesses uh, got difficulty obtaining uh, credit. In Europe as well, during the last few years, small and medium businesses in the periphery in particular are facing an incredible credit shortage uh, as a result of the functioning of the monetary union and financialization in Europe, um, where it's practically impossible to obtain uh, reasonably priced credit uh, from banks in, in, across the in Spain, in, in Greece, in Portugal. So that's the, answer, that's the best answer I can give you. Let me come to Hazel. Uh, what gave you the impression that I advocated taking away private housing from people who own it and giving it to the public? I didn't say that. <laughs> Actually, those who are taking private houses away from middle class and ordinary people are not mad socialists. It's the banks. <laughs> when, you look, when you look at what's been happening in the United States, and when you look at what's been happening in Spain, for instance, the last uh, uh, five years or so, when people have been losing their homes, it's actually the banks that have been taking their houses, these houses away. Uh, I'm arguing for a restoration of public provision. I'm not saying that we will confiscate private housing in Belgium. That's not what I meant. And that's the impression you gave. So, so, the, the, so the, 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 I'm arguing for a restoration of public provision. Um, in the sense that the mechanisms for housing provision, I don't quite know how the system works in Belgium because every housing market is a bit different uh, in every country. I know something about the German market, for instance, it's very different from the US, from the US and the UK market. Um, I know a lot about the UK market, which must be the most dysfunctional market in the world when it comes to, uh, to housing. Uh, the argument I put across is a generic argument about the role of housing in financialized capitalism. This isn't about, let's use that and get a standard answer for every country. If Belgium has got no housing problem, then Belgium's got no housing problems. Uh, I don't know the data. I don't know the, the story. I remain to be shown. But the argument about providing better public provision of housing seems to be very strong whichever country you look at. It can't be that everyone can obtain um, reasonable funds for housing in Belgium. I can't believe that. It can't be that it's so um, uh, so optimal 
uh, in the case of Elche. Um, so even here, I would argue, I suspect, uh, there would be a case for uh, public provision for housing. In the case of the UK, in the case of other parts of uh, the world, including the United States, the argument is unanswerable, it seems to me. Private provision of housing, uh, the private mechanisms for solving the housing problem um, have basically failed in, in, in a major way in, in key countries. Um, so that's all I'm arguing. Um, and again, I repeat, those who are actually dispossessing people in Europe and in the United States are not radical socialists and others, it's the banks. They are dispossessing people left, right, and center in the world. A lot of people think that they can do it in the sense of, let me put my money into um, ethical investments. I've got nothing against that. If you wish to do that, do it. But the answer will not come from that. The answer will not be, uh, will not come from all of us putting our money into ethical investment. I'm not against it. If that's what you want to do, do it. Um, Dealing with internationalization must be done in the aggregate and through uh, organization and through social forms of controlling uh, these phenomena. These can take uh, a variety of forms. They can be associational, communal, uh, locally provided finance, I'm not against that, locally provided means of credit and trading and money. Again, that cannot be the total answer, but I'm not against it if that's what particular societies want to do it, and if that works for them, let's do it, uh, uh, in terms of confronting uh, the major pressures of internationalization. Uh, but again, the answer must come uh, through aggregate organization, and it must come through overturning uh, established patterns of power and established patterns of uh, uh, economic influence. There must be a break. Uh, it cannot be done smoothly through individual uh, you talked about uh, the first wave of finance, financialization uh, at the end of the 19th century, the major link with imperialism. Uh, there was a conquer for foreign markets that culminated in uh, World War I. Um, uh, in the, this second wave of financialization, do you see also conflicts uh, between states uh, and possible also military conflicts to follow? In the, 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 the dominant, uh, not the ideology, but maybe this, the, the, the way the debates are shaped is for more and more privatization. And this is what we see in policies. So it makes your case more difficult over time. Right? And in the same time, we see that the European institutions, the policy they suggest for the moment and they put on the table and that are debated, are giving more and more strengths to this big uh, financial institution, this big bank. They are promoting further the investment banking model. And to add another layer, um, there is more private finance. That is, uh, we give more access to private finance in, for example, the form of the public-private uh, partnerships to finance uh, infrastructure or whatsoever, leveraging on public funds and uh, thanks to private funds. And uh, on top of that, we give more rights to private investors with the free trade agreements and the additional rights that are given to private investors over anyone here and over states through the investor state dispute settlements and other mechanisms. So it looks like the machinery is getting more and more constraining. You know? So it will require much more energy, for example. Wouldn't, wouldn't the solution? Uh, be to to uh, stop to start with a basic income, so we can break the change of the capitalist discipline, so we can boost inflation, and we can deal with the debt problem. And for me, the debt problem is in, is in its essence a problem of inequality, and inequality give give rise to the to the debt problem. So would, would could that not be the first step? And I, I I don't talk about ecological catastrophes that we are heading to. I leave that out of the equation, but just the first step. So we can change the political economic system, just install a basic income, deal with the debt problem, deal with the capitalist discipline, and break free, and start something new. Certainly we live in a period of wars. I mean, there, there, there are now more wars than God knows when. All this stuff about peace, 
and, and a new period of stability. And that's just nonsense. This is there are more wars now, especially in uh, in developing countries than than ever. Um, but I want to stress that the current period of financialization, the expansion of finance, is actually quite different from the previous one, which was analyzed by classical Marxists differently in many. And the difference is fundamental. The argument about the 19th and 20th century was that big business and big finance became closely interrelated. Uh, with each other, because big business uh, financed its investment. Banks then dictated the performance and the operations of big business. Banks became like uh, the determining element of how industry and commerce work. And at the same time, countries began to establish um, commercial barriers among each other. It's the opposite of creating a global market. Um, tariffs were imposed. That period was characterized by rising power of banks over businesses and tariffs, separating and splitting the world into distinct trading areas. And the conflict uh, arguments and the imperial arguments began to emerge across these distinct trading areas, each of which has, it, has its own combination of banks and big business. So you had the, the British Empire, the French Empire, uh, emerging German Empire, which never actually realized, uh, Russian Empire, and so This was a period of wars and revolutions in that way, the territorial redivision of the world. Today we see different phenomena. We see plenty of wars, to be sure, plenty of tension, plenty of aggression, plenty of instability. But we don't see the recreation of formal empire in that way, and we don't see the recreation of uh, territorial division when it comes to trade. Actually, there's a global market uh, in this way, and no, no systematic use of tariffs. So some of the elements of tension and conflict that we saw 100 years ago are not here. There is conflict, and there is imperialism, to be sure. There is imperialism in Europe, and there is imperialism across the world, for sure. Um, but the functioning of it and the connection with, with financialization is a lot more complex and a lot more mediated than it was in the That's all I've got to, to say. Now, on the question you asked about policy, I think that's a very, very important observation you're making. Back in 2009, I remember very well the, the August, September 2008, when banks were collapsing like a deck of cards. If, there was, if the state was absent, there wouldn't have been a bank standing in the United States. Um, there was talk then of a Minsky moment, in other words, uh, some fundamental instability of the capitalist system getting emerged, and talk of even nationalizing banks in the United States. Paul Volcker came up with this, no less. So there was hope that something was going to happen throughout 2009. Maybe it's interesting to say that Paul Volcker was the the head of the Federal Reserve Bank in, in the 80s and in the 70s and 80s. Paul Volcker is the man who invented neoliberalism as, as policy. Not, not this concept, but this policy. Um, this is the kind of man, US conservatism when it comes to finance. Um, so there was hope that something would change. This hope died in 2009. It lasted for about six months, and then it was snuffed out. And essentially, nothing fundamental has changed. I want to stress that, because if you read the financial press, and if you read the articles and, and things written by banks, you'd believe that things are dramatically different. Actually, they're not. This is still very much a financialized world. The, the, the fundamental parameters are, are recognized with the same. Uh, even though we're going to pass it free, and this, the fundamental logic is the same. Why? Because the financial system made sure that nothing fundamental would change and financialization would continue. What's the outcome? That's what's interesting. The outcome is stagnation this time. This time they cannot reignite what I showed you before. There is financialization, and the system chugs along, but there is no bubble. And there is no bubble because of the overwhelming accumulation of debt that I showed you before, and because of the, of the, the weight of the crisis 
that the previous expansion generated, and because essentially the system stabilized itself through public intervention, not out of its own strength. It has got no strength at all. It's obvious. Europe is stagnant because of the monetary union and what that does. The United States is less stagnant, but actually it's got no dynamism itself if you take the state away. So the core of the system, the core of the financialized world has not changed, but it's not going anywhere. And that's the paradox of our time. This is stagnation, essentially, um, with uh, persistent of, uh, persistence of financialization and persistence of uh, negative features everywhere. And actually, we might be heading back towards um, another crisis. That's the world we're going through. That's the world we're living through. And that makes it all the more important to argue in terms of public solutions. The only mechanism that actually uh, is available to shock the system out of what uh, it does at the moment is uh, a mechanism of the public sector. Uh, a variety of mechanisms of the public sector, including public finance. Inequality is, uh, is, is derived out of um, um, tax mechanisms, the way taxes work, and uh, out of stagnant real incomes or very slowly rising real incomes. And out of the appropriation of profit through financial methods, the financial profit I showed you before, has been uh, a prominent mechanism for the extraction of high incomes by the top layer of the distribution. <coughs> so inequality has been um, uh, a clearly recognized feature of um, financialization. Therefore, redistribution of income, the redistribution of, of wealth, must be a mechanism that must be put in place in any kind of reversal of financialization. The point I want to stress, and maybe I'm too old-fashioned, is that the problems of capitalism never start from distribution. I know that everybody likes to talk about inequality. Pick it is in this book that he has done. Um, and it's, a, it's a good book, too. But the problems of capitalism don't, don't come out of distribution. Distribution isn't what drives the problem. Distribution is the result. If, if wages um, are not rising fast, and if inequality is growing, there's something else behind it that explains it. And unless you deal with, it, you deal with that something else behind it, you'll never deal with inequality. So guaranteed minimum income, other ways of redistributing income and wealth are all very well but by themselves will not deal with the problem uh, unless you also change the structural forces behind the organization. So that's why I talked about public provision, uh, the role of the uh, public sector, and so on. In short, you cannot answer the problems of the modern era by imposing taxes on the rich and uh, raising the income of the poor, although I'm in favor of both. <laughs> you must do both. But that's not uh, the answer for the problems we're facing. You must, you must, you must in, in, introduce structural change. Uh, the speaker zei dat uh, privé banken, dat dat een misser was. Hij zegt ook dat de publieke bank uh, met controle van de staat, dat dat ook geen zo'n goed idee is. Uh, mijn vraag is, wat stelt u dan voor? Like I said, I don't really know the housing system of Belgium. But I'm glad that you point out that there is a shortage of affordable housing um, and that public provision housing isn't, isn't as uh, plentiful as it uh, might have been. Um, Belgium, <coughs> compared to other countries in Europe, Belgium doesn't really have that serious a problem of debt and that serious a problem of deficits. Um, it does, partly. But compared to other countries of Europe, compared to other countries of Europe, it's not um, probably the worst. Um, but in the end, when it comes to housing, um, the real question is how to allocate public resources at the moment. It's not really necessary. I, I remain to be convinced 
uh, when I look at the situation of uh, Europe and European countries at the moment, what restrains private housing is the inability of the state uh, to obtain enough funds in the open markets and to invest. I showed you uh, the increase in state indebtedness. Actually, there isn't very much state indebtedness in, in a variety of countries. Spain, the indebtedness in Spain was 15% of GDP when the crisis broke out. It's, so, the, Spain didn't collapse because of state borrowings. A lot of debt ended up with the state after the banks had gone bankrupt. It's private debt. So, if Spain wished to engage in a policy of expanding public housing, there were plenty of funds about to do it. There was plenty of availability to do it. It, it chose not to do it. And it chose to allow private capital to engage in speculation. I think that's the problem in Europe and across many parts of the world, rather than the inability of the state to borrow. The state chose to retreat from public provision of housing, and it chose to open the field to private provision funded through banks. It's a conscious choice. Uh, we can't borrow anymore. I agree that right now the states of Europe need to do a variety of things before they engage in an expansion of housing. Because the monetary union has failed and because the situation of uh, finance Public finance is very weak and very poor in Europe. So there are other things that need to be done. I understand that. Uh, the, the, the situation of debt must be confronted. Uh, the situation of um, austerity must be confronted. Um, so I'm not saying that the first step uh, should be that. However, if a different policy is adopted in Europe, if we break with this policy of austerity, and if we break with this nonsensical monetary arrangement which imposes austerity, then a mechanism for boosting aggregate demand in Europe, Europe needs demand, would be also um, in part resting on housing. Quite how that should be done will vary from country to country. I wish, I cannot give you any advice, I don't presume, because I don't know enough about Belgium. But in general, aggregate demand in Europe could definitely benefit um, by focusing some of uh, its attention on housing uh, because Europe does have a housing problem. Um, that's all uh, I would say there. Um, on public banks now, this is one of the most fundamental questions of the, of the era, the period. Private banking is failed. It's very difficult to see exactly what private banking offers to the world right now. What does it do? They don't, in Europe, they don't lend. Um, they don't provide particularly good liquidity services. They require enormous amounts of private, of public capital. They're sitting like a brick on the European economy, trying to deal with the problematic balance sheets. They're a permanent threat to the European economy. What do they offer? I just don't see it. Um, To me, again, I repeat, if this was well-functioning capitalism, a lot of these banks would have gone out of business. But it isn't. This is financialized capitalism, and they are protected. What does this indicate? What it indicates to me is that we shouldn't be trying to create healthy private banks. Right now, this is not a good direction to go towards. We should be trying to create healthy public banks, but healthy public banks. We, don't, we shouldn't be recreating some of the public banking that we've seen in many parts of the world, even in Germany, about which not much is said. What does this mean? This means that we need a new public spirit of banking. We need a, we need a public debate on banking, proper public debate on banking, not determined by the banks, but determined by public agents, about what kind of public banking we require. A provision of public bank, we need provision of public banking as public service as a utility to a certain extent. Households need provision of banking insofar as they need it as a utility. Most people don't need banks to provide them with money to, get to invest. They need banks to provide them with financial services to allow them to uh, make the purchases they need on a daily basis and to maintain the expenditure they, 
they wish to maintain. That's a type of utility. Uh, okay, we thought of as a utility. We need one type of bank uh, uh, of that type. We need bank. We need savings banks in Europe where people can put their money away and keep it there instead of playing games with it. We need investment banks in Europe, in, uh, long-term investment banks in Europe. We need a range of banking institutions that can actually provide services, uh, which are lacking in Europe, we, in Europe, which the big banks do not provide. Um, I have no blueprint for this, but we need a public debate along these lines. And the private financial interest is preventing this public debate. Because the logic always is private banks are the answer and defend big banks, and they will tell you uh, what you should do. Yeah, I know.